This video provides an overview of bradycardia rhythms and how we manage those rhythms according to the 2020 ACLS algorithms, especially as that applies in an EMS setting. What we find in this bradycardia category are primarily sinus bradycardia and the various heart blocks. In our initial approach, simply recognizing that this is a symptomatic bradycardia is acceptable. But as we explore treatment options, it's important to determine the specific rhythm because that will impact some of our treatment choices. A few key factors to remember in determining heart blocks. In a first degree block, every impulse still goes through, but with a slight delay. We identify it by simply noting that it looks like a normal sinus rhythm, but with a long PR interval. In a second degree type 1 block, the PR interval gradually lengthens until a QRS is dropped, and then the pattern repeats. Think longer, longer, longer dropped. And of course this is the one that's also called a winky bock. With a second degree type 2, there may be no pattern to the dropped beats, but every time the AV node does its job, it does so consistently, meaning the PR interval is the same. But sometimes the impulse doesn't go through at all. And finally with a third degree block, the AV node is no longer allowing any impulses to go through. We see P waves firing regularly because that's what the sinus node does, and we see regular QRS complexes, usually slow and wide, doing their own thing, but there is no connection between what is happening in the atria and the ventricles. I'm going to break down the ACLS bradycardia algorithm step by step to help you understand the logic behind the treatment choices, and more importantly, to give you practical ways to apply it effectively. The first step is to make absolutely sure that you should be using this algorithm at all. There are a variety of conditions and situations that will make patients bradycardic. For example, this could be an acute MI with the body attempting to reduce myocardial workload and therefore decrease oxygen demand. Or the bradycardia could be a response to increasing intracranial pressure or to hypertension in the setting of trauma or a stroke. This algorithm is designed to manage those patients where the slow heart rate is the problem. The best but not the only clue to whether or not you should attempt to increase the rate is your patient's blood pressure. If the patient is maintaining a relatively normal BP, the rate is probably not the problem and you need to assess for other causes. Step two is to cover the basics. Airway support and oxygen if they need it, get an ECG, blood pressure and pulse oximetry, start an IV, and plan on doing a 12 lead as soon as practical, which may be after you have initiated interventions based on what you find in step three. Step three is where we assess our patient and make a rapid determination if they are stable or unstable. The idea here is to quickly decide how aggressively this patient needs to be treated. If they are truly sick, we need to act fast and take steps to increase their rate before they deteriorate any further. If they are stable, we need to be more cautious and we should monitor our patient and be prepared to intervene if and when they become more symptomatic. The American Heart Association has identified these five criteria as the most appropriate ways for us to make that determination of stable versus unstable. These are the identical criteria that you see on the tachycardia algorithm. One of these symptoms alone doesn't automatically justify aggressive treatment and there is still a lot of room for clinical judgment. But the more of these symptoms that are present, or the more severe those symptoms are, the more we should consider moving straight to pacing or atropine. If based on our assessment, we decide our patient is unstable, then we move to the treatment box, which recommends atropine as the most appropriate intervention. If atropine is ineffective, then we move on to one of the following three options transcutaneous pacing, or a dopamine or epinephrine infusion. Atropine is a reasonable, safe, and appropriate choice for most symptomatic bradycardias. The dose is a one milligram bolus, which can be repeated every three to five minutes to a maximum total dose of three milligrams. At this stage, you are expected to apply some clinical judgment, and there are a few caveats to consider with atropine. If you do not have IV access, and gaining access is difficult and takes some time, and your patient is significantly unstable, it may be very appropriate to move directly to pacing prior to attempting atropine. If your patient is in a second degree type 2 or a third degree heart block, 
atropine is much less likely to be effective. So if your patient is significantly unstable, it is reasonable to either go straight to pacing initially or to switch to pacing after only one or two doses of atropine rather than giving the maximum amount, which takes about 10 minutes or more to deliver. This quote from the ACLS text is worth remembering. Atropine administration should not delay external pacing or beta adrenergic infusion for patients with impending cardiac arrest. It's up to you as the clinician to attempt to determine if a cardiac arrest is about to happen. Epinephrine and dopamine both have chronotropic properties, meaning they will speed up the heart rate, and they are both also vasoconstrictors, which means you must make sure your patient is not hypovolemic before using them. Which of these two drugs you use will be determined by provider preference or local protocol. The doses are shown here, and it's generally a good idea to start the infusion at the lower end of the accepted range and increase slowly until heart rate and blood pressure improve. If all our treatment options are ineffective, we now need expert consultation, or transvenous pacing, which is not usually an option in a pre-hospital setting. Unlike the tachycardia algorithm, which gives us several treatment options for stable patients. With bradycardias that are stable, meaning they do not meet the unstable criteria listed here, the guidelines simply tell us to monitor and observe, or typically in EMS, monitor and transport. The point here is that if your patient is tolerating a bradycardia well, and it is not causing significant symptoms, they can most likely continue to tolerate that rhythm with relatively little risk of deterioration. A quick summary of the algorithm. Is the slow rate the problem? If not, find the cause. If the rate is the problem, you're on the right page. Do what we do. Airway support and oxygen if needed. Monitor IV 12 lead. Then decide if your patient is stable or unstable. Use your clinical judgment to decide how aggressively to manage the patient. If they're stable, monitor and observe, recognizing that no treatment may be needed. If they're unstable, atropine is your first choice in most cases, and it can be repeated up to a dose of 3 milligrams. In the more serious AV blocks, or in the case of impending arrest, pacing may need to be your first intervention. If both atropine and pacing are ineffective, we have two acceptable options to consider using, and both are beta adrenergic infusions, dopamine or epinephrine, and these are always administered as infusions. If all our interventions are ineffective, we need to look for underlying causes, and we need to get a cardiologist involved. The bottom line with bradycardia management is to assess your patient. If they're truly sick, it is appropriate to aggressively work to correct the issue. If they are stable, a more cautious approach is warranted and no immediate intervention is needed.